Welcome to CS Guitars, the science of loud. It's been a couple of months since we last took a look at the Gibson Gothic Flying V, and at that point we'd upgraded to some gold hardware parts to change the aesthetic of the instrument. Since then, a lot has happened, as you can see here. If you are a Patreon supporter with a return from the Void perk activated, then you will already have seen a detailed video showing off all these new parts and discussing the processes that I'm about to undertake in this video. The biggest divergence from the plan at the end of the previous video came in the form of Richard from Indra Guitars. Indra produced custom metal pick guards aged and etched with intricate designs, and Richard got in touch to suggest his services as an option for the Flying V. Needless to say, I was hooked after checking out Indra's previous work and decided on the spot this was the new direction for the Flying V. I've got links to Indra's sites in the description should you want to check out these beautiful works for yourself. Here are the custom Indra parts as they arrived with me. As you can see, there are two main themes at play. Pictish iconography and Mary Anning inspired paleontology. Here we have the scratch plate and as you can see, it still requires all the control holes to be drilled into it. I chose to do this myself as there were some discrepancies between the template that Richard was using and the pick guard that came originally on this guitar. We decided that it was best if I drilled the holes once I got all the parts in and could line it up with the guitar. That way there could be no mistakes. The truss cover is back to the large style which looks incredible. We have a new 12th fret inlay that needs to be installed and the most important part, the V string plate for converting this guitar to string through. Let's start with the inlay. I did a test cut on a scrap piece of mahogany to ensure that I haven't lost my inlaying technique. The inlay fits perfectly in the test route, but mahogany is a much softer wood than the ebony that the V's fretboard is made out of, so the real job is going to be a little more complex. I'm attempting to achieve this without removing any frets. If I can do it right, then I'll be able to inlay the brass to the correct depth and only have to do very light strip sanding to get it level. This will reduce the risk of any damage to the frets in removing and reinstalling them. Scoring around the positioned inlay with a sharp scalpel blade is critical to the process. This hard cut line will be the path of least resistance if any material tries to break away while I am routing, so this should minimise any chance of things chipping out of bounds. Using a Dremel in a router base and a small cutting bit, I can plunge this tiny router into the fretboard and start removing material small bits at a time and working down to the required depth. I'll only take the router as close to the edges of the design as I dare. Once the bulk of the material is removed, I spend a lot of time refining the shape with scalpel blades, chipping and scraping away until the inlay sinks flush. Riding the frets with the router means that I can cut the slot to the radius of the fretboard. This is important. I can radius my inlay by hammering it on my radius block. Installing a flat inlay would mean that I would either be low in the middle or high on the outsides, and in that case trying to sand it level would destroy the details in the inlay, something that I really wish to avoid. Having an inlay that matches the radius of the board allows me to do far less sanding in the levelling process and hopefully will allow me to retain a lot more of the fine details, as well as ensuring that there's no gap underneath the inlay so that we can make a solid connection to the fretboard. With the cavity to the correct depth and dimensions, I can install the inlay using superglue. I apply ample superglue on top of the inlay, firstly to fill in all the detail areas and protect the black colour beneath, and secondly to fill any gaps in the wood around about the inlay. These will become invisible against the black wood once the superglue dries. And here's what we're left with after sanding away the excess superglue with progressively finer strips of sandpaper. A perfectly smooth and flush inlay. Some of the very finest details were lost to the sanding process, but I feel this is somewhat of an inevitability. This was a very delicate procedure with only the finest level of tolerances, as those etched parts are quite shallow, not very deep at all into the brass. So to get it completely level and flush and retain this level of detail is a complete win. 
Okay, with that success under our belt, let's move on to the string through conversion. The first thing that I'll need to do is remove the old stop bar inserts, as I'll eventually want to fill and refinish over this hole. The inserts have been finished over by the black nitrocellulose, but the tops of them are protected by masking tape, so I can take a sharp blade, cut around this, and it peels away easily. Removing the inserts is just as easy as doing the ones at the bridge. By using the post and stop bar as leverage, I can pull these out by hand. They will offer a little resistance, but should come out without any issue. The second insert will eventually be covered by the pick guard, but we need to remove it anyway, as it's currently holding the bridge ground wire in place. We'll have to put this ground wire somewhere else, now that we're removing the stop bar. By using the scratch plate and bridge, I can position the string plate, line it up with the centre line of the guitar, and measure exactly where the holes will enter on the front, and exit on the rear. Now this is where having a drill press would be exceptionally useful in ensuring that the holes are being drilled perpendicular to the body. Unfortunately, I only have access to a hand drill, and ensuring that this always stays at right angles is near impossible. But with the help of this tool, we can get close. This is a drill guide with steel collets which have holes the diameter of standard drill bits, and this will hopefully guide the drill bit and keep it perpendicular to the workpiece. But even with this, and with drill presses to some extent, the material that you are drilling through can deflect a drill bit, keeping it from following a straight path. Once again, I did a number of tests on a scrap piece of mahogany the same thickness as the mahogany body of the guitar. Every single test punched a hole true through the mahogany block, exiting exactly where it should. So my technique worked, everything was looking good, and I was feeling confident. This is where things started to go wrong. The first hole went through pretty true. I checked just as the tip of the brad point was puncturing the rear, and it was slightly off from the mark that I'd measured, but definitely within my accepted tolerances of doing this by hand. When I punched fully through with the drill bit, however, it blew huge chunks of material out the back of the guitar. This hadn't happened in any of my tests, and it shouldn't have happened here. So long as you have a scrap piece of backing wood making solid contact with the exit point, you can't get any blowout from a hole like this. What had happened in this case was that my backing wood was warped, and I hadn't noticed that the exit point of the workpiece was not making contact with the backing wood. But this mistake was completely salvageable. Because I'd been using tape, all these blowout pieces had remained in the same place. I could remove any stray fibres with a scalpel blade that were preventing the chunks going back into place, glue them in with wood glue, and we're almost back to normal. I'll be drilling into this for a bigger hole to fit the ferrule anyway, so most of this damage will go unseen. A little bit of sanding and a spot refinish, and you will never know this happened. Unfortunately, these sort of mistakes happen from time to time, but it was all good because there was a way for me to put it right. So I moved on to the next hole, which exited the back of the guitar perfectly, but in completely the wrong place. It was at this point that I screamed, poured myself a little whiskey, and sat down to consider how I could rectify this. It's important to walk away, calm down, and come back with a plan. Continuing on at this point would have just snowballed the mistakes, as the growing frustration would have started a cock-up cascade. What I realised is that I should have been drilling the larger ferrule holes from the rear first, to ensure they were in the right place, and then drilling the smaller string holes through from the front. This would mean that there's less material to deflect the smaller drill bit, and even if they did stray slightly, they would exit within the bigger hole. Once I started doing this, everything went ridiculously smoothly with no further problems. There was a little bit of small chipping around the holes, but nothing that I couldn't fill very easily and spot refinish, which is what I'm going to have to do with this area now anyway. That one hole that came out in the wrong place was plugged with mahogany, cut and filed level, and then re-drilled in the correct place. At the very least, all the ferrules are now in the correct places, and while it might seem messy at the moment, it's nowhere near as bad as it looks. A little bit of filling, sanding, and a spot refinish of the area, and it'll look as good as new. Guitar building, modification, and especially repair are less about things going perfectly, and a lot more about how you can rectify it when it inevitably goes wrong. 
This is frustrating and also embarrassing, but I wanted to show this as even with the best planning, mistakes can still happen. Frustration can get the better of us, and sometimes taking a second look yields a better technique. So if you're ever doing work like this, remember to think it through, test your process, measure twice, cut once, and if things do go wrong, step back, stay calm, and find a way to fix it. Installing the V-plate was probably the most satisfying part of the process. I'm holding it in place with these 6mm domed brass upholstery pins, which are very similar to what Gibson was using in the 50s. You can buy turned brass repros of these 58 style pins, 3 for 20 quid, but these upholstery pins do the same job, look the same, and were probably what Gibson were originally using anyway. These are hammered into the body until they securely pin the V-plate into place. You've got to make sure you've got your positioning correct, because once you've pinned this down, it's very difficult to remove it again. Now as we move on to the pick guard, we can see that there's a lot of holes to drill. Fortunately, I'm much better at drilling holes into sheet metal than I am drilling holes through wood. Using the original pick guard as a template, I can drill all the holes, including the screw mounting holes, the controls, and bridge hole. Most of these holes required me stepping up the drill bit sizes so that I could get a clean final result. The pick guard is backed in black plastic, so I will have to apply some adhesive copper shielding tape so that I can have a common ground for all the controls on the panel. All this gets commoned back to the ground connection on the output jack, which we can test with a multimeter set to continuity. The new ground wire for the bridge is installed under one of the bridge posts. When the strings are on the guitar, this will ground everything from the V-plate right up to the tuners. While I had all the electronics out, I swapped the tiny ceramic capacitor for an orange drop to get a more usable tone control. The pickup covers can now be soldered into place. By scuffing up the contact points between the base plate and the covers, we can ensure that the solder adheres correctly. Now the pickups can be repotted in wax. The pickups would have been wax dipped from factory to consolidate the coils, but now we've introduced a metal cover with an air gap which has the potential of vibrating independently of the entire pickup. This could result in microphonic effects which are undesirable. This is a mixture of paraffin and beeswax which I use to pot my pickups. It flows easily into all the free spaces and when it solidifies it holds everything in place. When the pickups are removed from the wax bath, they are held face down to prevent any wax escaping, the surfaces are wiped off, and they're left to cool. So now we come on to that truss cover. This large style plate absolutely looks the best on this guitar, but it does provide a little bit of a problem. Last time I installed a string buckler, a device designed to bring the strings into alignment as they come through the nut, for ease of tuning and stability of the strings in use. However, because the string butler requires to be installed under the two e-posts, we can't have both of these at the one time. But that's okay, as I have a cunning plan. As you can see, the truss cover is large enough that you can mount the posts directly to it in the correct locations and still retain the functionality of the butler. By removing the posts from the string butler, I can place the plate into position on top of the truss cover, which is screwed to the guitar. This gives me the correct positions to drill the holes in the cover. The posts have an M3 thread, so by drilling the holes with a smaller 2.5mm drill bit, and then tapping them with an M3 tap, I can thread the holes to have the correct pitch to thread the posts into place. I've opted to go for black posts with gold rollers as I felt this looked the best. However, I do have other options available should I change my mind. String Butler very kindly sent extra parts to allow me to do this, including a String Butler for the Flying V with gold posts and ones for the Les Paul style headstocks, including this one and the one that I've got installed on my Harley Benton. This one fixed the G-string tuning problems on this guitar completely, so a big shout out to String Butler for sending this stuff along. I've got links in the description if you're interested in getting some of these for yourself. Now this is a small detail, but you might be interested in the mounting screws themselves. These are the original pit guard screws that were in the guitar to start with. They were black back then, but now they are brass to match the guard. There's actually a pretty straightforward process for achieving this, which utilises a brass wire wheel chucked into a Dremel 
and a blowtorch. And it's something that I learned from watching blacksmiths do metalwork. By heating the screws with the blowtorch and then buffing them with the wire wheel, we deposit brass from the wheel onto the surface of the heated metal. We can use this process not just for the screws, but also for the nuts and other metal parts, which will keep the look consistent across the entire guitar. With everything back on the guitar, we can finally take a good look at it, and isn't she beautiful? This is a far better look than where we started, in my opinion, and I just love how the Indra parts integrate with the rest of the guitar. <laughs> So here's my closing remarks for this video. This turned out remarkably well. Aesthetically, it's perfect and it really suits my personality. Going string through brought up a number of effects. The strings now have more apparent tension and they sound much brighter, snappier and punchier than they did before. And this translates into the amplified sound as it really growls now. <laughs> Thank you. 
everything is so rock solid and stable in the tuning of this guitar, although there is a bit of ring from the strings behind the bridge after some hard percussive notes, so a Jimmy clip is going to go there to help alleviate that. The increased tension means that I'll probably experiment with different string gauges and tunings to see what works for this guitar now. It's a set of 10s that's on here at the minute in standard tuning, but it feels like a set of 10s on a Fender rather than a set of 10s on a Gibson. Some 9s might work well for standard tuning in this, reducing the tension and probably taking out some of the snappiness as well. But it is incredibly fun to play and that's the most important thing, I just do not want to put this down. There are still a few small things that need to be addressed. That stud hole needs to be plugged and refinished, so too does the back of the guitar with the ferrules don't look so pretty at the moment. I also entirely forgot to ask for a jack plate from Indra to match all the other parts, but I'm quite interested in trying my hand at making my own from a sheet of brass that I have and seeing if I get it to match up with the look of the rest of the guitar. But all of these things aren't urgent. The guitar is playable, rock solid and sounds fantastic, so expect to see it looking like this for a good while yet, and I'll probably do these little upgrades as I go here and there as I feel the desire to do so. And if you've liked this video and you want to see more content from me, then you can hit that subscribe button which will notify you of all new content as it comes out. My Patreon's also there for exclusive secret stuff, t-shirts are available and there's other videos you might not have seen. But that's all for now guys, keep it loud! And I'll see you later. V!